It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. And to the Premier, the Public Order Emergency Commission's lawyers have been very clear that if the Premier and Minister Jones don't testify, there will be important gaps in his record. For an instant last week, it seemed like just maybe the government recognized the value of testifying, only declining the Commission's invitation, quote, for the moment. According to the Premier, the buck stops with him, but apparently not when he will be forced to answer hard questions about the impact of his decisions. What changed the Premier's mind between last week and this Monday? And to respond, the government house leader. Again, Speaker, uh, I thank the, the member for the question. Uh, as he knows, uh, this, uh, of course, was a, a policing matter. The, uh, the Prime Minister uh, had made the decision to invoke the Federal Emergencies Act uh, uh, for the first time, and by the terms of that legislation, of course, a federal inquiry into the federal government's use of that act uh, has to take place. That obviously is happening right now. We are assisting the inquiry uh, by ensuring that uh, any key uh, cabinet documents that might uh, help inform uh, the Commission in doing its work uh, are made available uh, to the Commission at the same time. Uh, the Deputy Minister of uh, Transportation and the Deputy Solicitor General have also been made available uh, uh, to the Commission as they continue their work into the uh, uh, federal inquiry into the federal use of the Act. Thank you. Supplementary question. Yeah, I had no idea that the Premier's state of mind was a police matter, but I will move on. On October 17th, the Premier told reporters that he had not been asked to appear before the Commission in Ottawa. But lawyers for the Commission revealed that both the Premier and Minister Jones had been asked multiple times to appear voluntarily, with government lawyers being told as early as October 11th that there was possibility of a summons. So this government knew that the Premier and Minister Jones might be compelled to testify before the Premier said he'd never been asked by the Commission to appear. Very curious, Mr. Speaker. Can the Premier explain why he said he wasn't asked? In fact, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have been working with uh, the Commission and assisting them in doing uh, the work that is required by the terms of the uh, legislation. Uh, uh, when the federal government decided to invoke uh, the Federal Emergencies Act. As you know, uh, Speaker, it was a, a, policing, uh, a policing matter. The government of Ontario certainly doesn't direct the police, and I'm hoping that the Leader of the Opposition isn't suggesting that the government of Ontario should be directing police. But at the same time, it is important to assist the, the federal inquiry as it researches and investigates the federal government's decision to use the Federal Emergencies Act. That is why we are providing uh, cabinet documents to assist uh, the inquiry, uh, and that is why we're providing top uh, officials at uh, the Solicitor General's Ministry and the Ministry of Transportation to assist the inquiry as it uh, investigates the federal government's use of the Federal Emergencies Act. And the final supplement. Well, well, again, I'll note that to say this is a police matter, when I asked what the Premier was thinking when he said what he said, is not exactly being open and straightforward. If the Premier keeps hiding from the inquiry, we'll ask just two of the many questions the Commission has for him. We'll ask him right here, save him the bother and expense of having to go all the way to Ottawa. He can answer them here. First, why did the government wait two weeks to invoke provincial emergency powers? Not a police question. And why did the Premier decline to participate in at least two of three tripartite meetings between the City of Ottawa and the federal government? Response, government has Interesting question, Mr. Speaker, because the member is right. On two occasions, we, of course, had a state of emergency in the province uh, of Ontario. And by the terms of the uh, provincial state of emergency under the Reopening Ontario Act, we created a select committee to review the uh, Ontario, uh, Reopening Ontario Act. Uh, at the conclusion of both of those states of emergency, a report is presented to the House uh, outlining uh, why the government of Ontario went with a state of emergency. On both of those occasions, a four-hour debate then ensued on the government's use of a state of emergency in the province of Ontario. Now, the debate never lasted four hours because after one or two speakers, the opposition decided to sit down and not continue the debate on that, Mr. Speaker. And that is why I continue to say to the member opposite, this is not a po political issue. This is a policing matter that happened in Ottawa and happened in Windsor. And that is why we are assisting the federal uh, inquiry Response. into the federal government's use of the Federal Emergencies Act. 
That is why the Deputy Solicitor General has been put forward. That is why the Commissioner of the OPP has been forward. And that is why we're assisting by providing Cabinet-level documents that are important to the Commission's work at that time. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, we learned from the Commission hearings in Ottawa that while the Premier was busy hiding from his political responsibilities, the occupation of our city forced kids with cancer to miss chemo and radiation treatments at CHEO. Families of sick children were also forced to pay out of pocket for hotel rooms to ensure they weren't late for surgery. This was a crisis, Speaker, and the Commission wants to ask the Premier what solutions he had in mind to address it. Ottawa residents want to know, too. Is the Premier fighting the summons so he doesn't have to admit he had no plan? Uh, just the opposite, Mr. Mr. Speaker. As I've said on a number of occasions, of course, we are assisting the, the Commission. Uh, we are assisting the Commission after the federal government, the Prime Minister, decided to invoke the Federal Emergencies Act. Now, of course, no government has ever uh, 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 utilized the Federal Emergencies Act, but by the terms of the Act which was brought in, uh, a federal uh, commission of inquiry has to be uh, 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 invoked so that they can ascertain whether the use of the Emergencies Act by the federal government was appropriate at the time. Now, in doing so, Mr. Speaker, it is important to note that uh, we've ensured that the Commissioner of the OPP, that OPP officials are present to assist the Commission in doing its work because ultimately this was a policing matter. The member should know uh, that the Ontario government does not direct its police and how to undertake uh, uh, its, its activities. That is why the Commission is investigating. That is why they brought forward the Commissioner of the OPP. That is why we are providing the Deputy Solicitor General. Bonds. Why we are providing the Deputy Minister of Transportation. And that is why we are assisting by proactively sending important Cabinet documents to the Commission so that it can help in doing its work. Supplementary question. Kids missing chemo treatments isn't just a police matter, Speaker. It's a crisis, and it's a crisis that the Premier had no plan to address. Yeah. Workers in Ottawa lost thousands of dollars in income because the occupation shut their workplaces down for 28 days. They used up all their savings, struggled to pay rent, had cell phones cut off, and defaulted on student loan payments. One of the questions the Commission wants to ask the Premier is why he wouldn't attend tripart meetings on the situation. And guess what, Speaker? Ottawa residents want to know that too. Why does the Premier think he doesn't owe Ottawa workers any answers? Speaker, I, as I reiterate uh, to the member, uh, uh, there actually Ontario was in a state of emergency at that time, and there was a select committee which was formed of all members uh, of uh, the House, which also included uh, the independent members. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, in that select committee, I appeared before that select committee whilst the uh, the uh, the situation was unfolding in Ottawa. Uh, Speaker, at the conclusion of the state of emergency in the province of Ontario, of course, a report was presented to this house, and a four-hour debate uh, was convened to investigate the Ontario government's use of the emergency of the state of emergency at that time. Uh, of course, debate on that collapsed when the opposition felt that it no longer needed uh, to review Order. the government's decision to. Uh, have a state of emergency. Now, having said that, we want to assist the Commission in its work in the federal government's first ever use of the Emergencies Act, and that is why we're proactively sending uh, documents to assist, uh, cabinet level documents, frankly, Mr. Speaker, to assist uh, the Commission in doing uh, its work as it reviews uh, the, the decision of the federal government and the policing actions uh, during that time. Thank you. Final supplementary. Kids missing chemo, workers without income, and the Premier doesn't think he needs to offer any answers. The occupiers harassed school children and their parents and threatened to drive circles around local elementary schools. They trapped people with disabilities in their homes, preventing paratranspo from getting downtown. They took food from a homeless shelter. The Commission wants to know why the Premier waited until February 11 to declare a provincial emergency. Stop me if you've heard this one before, Speaker, but Ottawa residents want to know that too. So will the Premier quit hiding? come to Ottawa and testify and give Ottawa residents the answers we deserve. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we came to this legislature at the conclusion of the state of emergency in the province of Ontario. We submitted a, a report on the Ontario government's use of the state of emergency. We allowed for a four-hour debate in this House on the state of emergency. Now, that debate collapsed soon after it began, 
ostensibly because the opposition official did not opposition come to order warranted any further debate they were in, in essence in agreement on what was uh, what was on the invocation of a state of emergency in the province of ontario having said that the federal government has a different member for davenport comes to order the federal government invoked a state of emergency uh, the emergency uh, act uh, and by the terms of invoking the Emergencies Act for the first time, their process is, is that there has to be an inquiry into the Response. Prime Minister's invocation of the Act, and that is why we are providing cabinet for Niagara documents Falls come to, order. to assist. That is why the Commissioner of the OPP is there, and that is why top officials at Transportation and the Deputy Solicitor General are appearing before the Commission. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is the Premier and the people of Windsor would appreciate if the Premier would actually stand up and answer it. <laughs> Speaker, while protesters shut down the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor, the Premier chose to sit on his hands and do nothing, much like he is now. The City of Windsor, along with the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association and the Canadian Vehicle Manufacturers Association, had to file an injunction in an attempt to end the blockade. This was after the mayor and chief of police wrote to the premier and Minister Jones requesting additional supports. Again, this government chose not to ask. So my question is two-part, Speaker. Why won't the premier and Minister Jones appear before the Emergencies Act Inquiry Committee and explain why they refuse to help the people of, of Windsor? And the commission wants to know why did the, this government, the provincial government, delay using provincial emergency orders? The member opposite will remember that during that time I appeared in front of the select committee that this House struck with respect uh, to the uh, uh, state of emergency that was invoked uh, uh, by, the, by the Premier uh, Speaker. She will know that she asked uh, many of the similar questions and that answers were provided in an extensive uh, appearance in front of the, uh, of the select committee that this House struck because that is the process here in the province of Ontario. Now, it is a process that we proactively put in place. Mr. Speaker, we proactively put in place. I hear the member for Ottawa say two weeks later, actually, no, a year ahead of time. A year ahead of time, Mr. Speaker, because we wanted to ensure we wanted to ensure that when the state of emergency under the Reopening Ontario Act was in place, that this parliament had the right to overview and to assess what was happening. That is why we then brought a report to Response. this House, not on one occasion but on two occasions, and allowed for hours of debate, which they, on both occasions, allowed to collapse after mere hours, Mr. Speaker. We did what we had to do to keep the people of Ontario safe. Question. Speaker, we know that every hour of the Ambassador Bridge blockade caused a catastrophic impact to our local economy with ripple effects on both sides of the border. Yet the Premier took days to intervene. When it comes to Ottawa, he was at the cottage on a snowmobile for part of it. Premier Ford and Minister Jones skipped out on several intergovernmental meetings while the blockade in Windsor and the occupation in Ottawa raged on. The pre this premier claims to be the most accessible and transparent premier ever in history. So, Speaker, why do the premier and Minister Jones continue to hide instead of coming clean about their delays and inaction? I think now we're getting to the crux of it, colleagues. I think we're getting to the crux of it. What you're hearing from the NDP is, is that should they ever get the right to form government, which we have already confirmed will never happen in the province of Ontario, they want to have the ability to direct the police. Yep, the, they want to have the ability now to order the police how to order. do their job. Yep. Now, the people of the province of Ontario remember full well what happened when they had the authority to do anything. They bankrupted the, the, the province of Ontario. Now, can you imagine? Imagine the NDP now standing in this house and suggesting that the government of Ontario should de direct the police on how to do their jobs. The conservation officers that are here Order. must be trembling in their boots at the thought that this crew might be ordering them how to do Spons. their jobs. How about we allow the police to decide how to police the province of Ontario in a safe fashion? The official opposition will come to order.
Please start the clock. Next question, the member for Etobicoke Lake. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I have a very important question for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, from 2011 to 2018, the Liberal government, they actually produced only 611 long-term care beds, Shame. and that's all that was added to our system. Order. You know what? For many years, the Liberal government, propped up by the NDP, overlooked the realities of Ontario's aging population and were indifferent to their needs. As the needs of our aging population becomes more prominent, the failure of past governments to plan ahead was not only neglectful, but disrespectful to Ontario residents and our seniors who need care. Their inaction and failures have contributed to the gaps that are evident today. Speaker, what is this minister doing to address the growing needs for long-term care beds in this province? Good question. Wow. Leonard Kingston Trump. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for the question. After years of neglect from successive governments, we have made a commitment to fix long-term care. Our government is investing $6.4 billion to develop new beds as well as redevelop existing beds to meet modern standards. Currently, in the development pipeline, we have over 60,000 net new beds and upgraded beds. But this is only one component of our plan to fix long-term care. We are also improving the quality of life and care for residents. We are doing this by hiring and retaining personal support workers, installing air conditioning in every resident's room, and increasing care to a new standard of four hours per resident per day. This is up from just over two hours. Our government is making historic investments in long-term care to fix years of Spons. liberal neglect and to get it done for the seniors of Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the parliamentary assistant for his response. Speaker, as Ontarians age, their health care needs grow, and these needs are felt throughout the community through increased demands for hospitals, retirement homes, long-term care and emergency services. The parliamentary assistant mentioned that the government is building approximately 60,000 new and upgraded long-term care beds across this province, and I'm pleased and very thankful that 256 new beds are coming to my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore. With many Ontarians nearing the age of retirement and with many others already requiring long-term care, it is important that these beds are built quickly and efficiently. Speaker, can the minister please provide an update on the status of these projects? Member for Lanark, Clark, Matt Kingston. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again uh, to the member for the question. As of September, 44 long-term care projects are currently under construction or have already opened their doors. I have had the pleasure of visiting some of these beautiful new homes. But building these beds is only one part of our government's plan to fix long-term care. We recognize that many Ontarians need additional support right now to stay in their homes, which is why we have invested in community paramedics. Through this service, paramedics conduct in-home visits and remotely monitor the health of Ontarians. Just this morning, there was a testimonial in the Northumberland News which said, this program has helped keep my mom out of the hospital. Since we have been on the program, her anxiety is down and she is doing much better. Response. The Northumberland Chief of Paramedics said, working with our community partners, this is another opportunity to make healthcare services more easily accessible to vulnerable residents. This is exactly- Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Mishkigawak, James Bay. Thank you, Speaker. The crisis of health is getting worse every day, and we have a government that is not offering immediate solutions to help our communities. The hospital in my riding has requested and help for physicians to help leave the burden from the 
anesthesiologists to help them and support them. The Premier continues to tell them to share their ideas and their opinions to help ease the pressure from the, from, from the, from the system. Then why didn't the government answer since the call was made months ago? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite uh, for the question. Unlike previous governments in Ontario, which were supported by the opposition NDP, our government has taken many steps to improve the physician supply, including expanding medical education, Ontario's uh, International Medical Graduate Program, using other non-physician health care providers to provide team-based primary care, the Northern and Rural Recruitment Initiative, and the Northern Ontario Physician Retention Initiative, as well as locum programs. Programs. And I know you're speaking about your situation in your community in the north. Uh, we've expanded uh, uh, education for medical students, as I said, including at Lake Ridge Hospital, the Northern Ontario School of Medicine as well. And we have those northern initiatives, as I indicated, that help uh, provide physicians in the north. We're certainly going to continue to work on improving the physician supply in northern communities and all other communities in Ontario. My writing has submit a letter to request a follow-up since September, and I offered a copy in person. We've also asked another follow-up in October, and we still haven't received an answer. Mr. Speaker, it, that's not the end. What about the request from Ontario North Health East in relation to Bill 7? because the Notre Dame Hospital should be, should be evaluated in relation to patients in ALC and offering help in our communities. Will your government finally respond to our requests from hospitals to help our population in an efficient manner? Merci. And the response, member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite. I haven't seen the letter that you referred to, but our government is responding. And as I was saying, the things we're doing in the north include the Northern and Rural Recruitment and Retention Initiative program, which began earlier, but offers financial incentives to physicians to establish practices in rural and northern Ontario. And they grant about eighty to one hundred and seventeen thousand dollars paid out over four years while the physician establishes a practice there. They're available in any community defined as rural using the rurality index. And in all five of Ontario's northern urban rural uh, reference uh, centres, uh, Timmins, North Bay, Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie and Thunder Bay. We've also got the Northern Physician Retention Initiative, which provides eligible physicians in northern Ontario with a $7,000 retention incentive paid at the end of the fiscal year if they continue to practice full-time in northern Ontario beyond an initial four years. We're going to keep working on initiatives to make sure we have the physician supply we need in the north and elsewhere. Thank you. Next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Speaker, my question is to the Associate Minister of Housing. Recently, a report from the Union Bank of Switzerland stated that Toronto and GTA have one of the riskiest housing markets in the world. According to the study, the report says that the home prices have raised, increased by 17 per cent in Toronto and GTA compared to a year ago. The study also highlights low level of housing under construction, that the local housing prices are rising rapidly due to the high demand of speculation. The prices of housing is becoming more and more, unafford more, and more unaffordable for people who want to move into Richmond Hill. Speaker, can the minister please share what our government is doing to help build more homes and provide housing opportunities for my constituents in Richmond Hill? Well done. The Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you very much. Good morning, Speaker. And I want to thank my uh, hardworking uh, colleague from Richmond Hill for that wonderful question and certainly for her tireless work in our community, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> we know housing prices have skyrocketed. We have seen report after report saying the same thing, which is why we have committed to introducing a housing action plan every year to address the crisis that we're currently in, Mr. Speaker. 
Our most recent bill, More Homes Built Faster, which was introduced just earlier this week, expanded on our agreement to work with municipalities by introducing as-of-right policies. Speaker, these new measures allow up to three units to be added on a residential property without needing a bylaw amendment or having to pay development charges. This means basement apartment, main residence, the garden house can be converted into a home without any barriers. It will immediately increase supply and provide some relief for local residents like those in Richmond Hill. Speaker, this is just Response. one of the many ways our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, is getting it done for Ontarians to build 1.5 million homes in, in the next 10 years. The supplementary question. Speaker, thank you to the Associate Minister of Housing for the answer. My constituents in Richmond Hill are concerned about the economic future and the ability to own a home. They are worried about rising interest rates and the lack of houses being built. They are concerned about what kind of house, housing options will be available for them if they will be able to live in the communities they grow up in. We are at a critical juncture to address this problem for the future generations. That is why we need our government to take urgent action today and ensure that houses are being built. Speaker, once again to the Associate Minister, what is the government doing to help build homes and build the homes faster? Associate Minister of Housing. Again, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to my colleague for the follow-up question. Speaker, we will be building more homes and building them faster by reducing unnecessary costs and expenses that are passed down directly to the consumer. We're making it easier and more predictable for builders to determine project costs and timelines so more homes can be built on budget and on time, Speaker. We're also setting local municipal housing targets in 29 of the largest municipalities to encourage home construction and development. For example, Speaker, right here in the City of Toronto, we're asking the city to build 285,000 more homes in 10 years. And in my riding, which I am proudly sharing with my colleague from Richmond Hill, we're asking the same for the city to build more than 27,000 new homes in that same time period. Mr. Speaker, we are taking the necessary bold steps that are needed to get more homes built faster. Our most recent bill adds to the foundation that is required to build 1.5 million homes. Which, Mr. Spons? Speaker, we are laser focused on making sure Ontarians have a house to go to every single night, one that is loving and safe for them, and we will not waver from that commitment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next question, the member for Seawhite Mouth. Uh, uh, speaker, uh, my question is to the Premier, Devon Freeman. A uh, young man from Jordina Island, First Nation, was 16 when he disappeared from the group whom he was in and died by suicide. His body was found six months later. At the inquest into Devon's Devon's uh, death, Mimi Singh, a lawyer for Ontario, said that the, this government could only endorse the spirit of the provincial recommendations. Speaker. Uh, is it the position of this government that recommendations designed to prevent the deaths of Indigenous children misconceives democracy? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to, to reply. The death of, of a child is a tragedy. Uh, and first and foremost, I want to offer our government's and my thoughts uh, to Devon Freeman's family and loved ones. And our government wants every child and youth to have a safe and loving and stable home Here. and for families to be strengthened and communities to be strengthened and supported through preventative services and early intervention. And that's why we've embarked on the child welfare redesign and that we will continue that work. Knowing the importance of these recommendations, our government is taking the time to review and properly consider them so that we can offer the right solutions that makes the lives of children and youth better. Thank you again. Supplementary question, Member 59. Speaker, uh, uh, we know that uh, recommendations of these systemic uh, issues that harm children have been presented over and over again. 
We have these recommendations from the inquest uh, from the deaths of children. Jeffrey Baldwin and Caitlin Sampson from 2014 and 2016. Now we have them from the inquest from Devon's death. It is unacceptable for this government to use jurisdiction and democracy as an excuse to withhold resources that could implement these recommendations. Speaker, uh, why is this government not properly supporting these recommendations from the inquest into the death of Devin Freeman? Thank you again, and, and I want to be clear that our government is supportive of all of the recommendations, but we want to make sure that the coroner's jury had an opportunity to, to review and see them. And so I also want to say um, that I'm grateful and our government is grateful to the jury, to the participants that were involved in this very difficult inquest. And we are reviewing the recommendations and we look forward to uh, them informing our continued work in this child, uh, child welfare redesign and in, in this case. Thank you. Next question, the member for Ottawa South. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Last February, the residents of Ottawa endured three weeks of lawlessness, lawlessness in their downtown core. People's personal safety, public safety were both under threat. People suffered. Women couldn't walk to work and feel safe. Na families couldn't enjoy their neighborhoods. They couldn't go to a park. Businesses were closed. And for two weeks, this Premier did nothing. Families want some answers as to why the Premier did nothing for two weeks. Two weeks. They deserve answers. And, Speaker, quite frankly, they deserve an apology. They deserve the Premier saying, I'm sorry that you had to endure that and my inaction caused it to go longer. Question. Speaker, the question is simple. Will the Premier stop his court action, apologize to the citizens of Ottawa, and give testimony in front of the inquiry? Premier? It's really, uh, it's really unreal what, I, what I'm hearing there, Mr. Speaker. The, the member from Ottawa, he knows it's a federal inquiry. He lives there. He lives there into the federal government's use of the Federal Emergencies Act. Not the Provincial Emergency Act. This is about the federal government. As much as, as, much as a member Order. wants to play politics and pretend that it's a, a provincial situation, as much as the Order. member wants me to direct the police, he Order. knows I don't direct the police. I don't direct municipal police. I don't direct provincial police. And I, do not Member for direct Davenport the Shandor. RCMP. Top officials from the OPP that were running the operation in conjunction with the municipal police and the RCMP, in my opinion, they did an incredible job. Response. But again, to the member from Ottawa, he knows it's a federal issue. He knows it's a federal inquiry, and that's up to the federal government. Not up to the provincial government, up to the federal government. Supplementary question. Therein lies the problem, exactly the same problem that happened last February. It's someone else's problem. It's not my problem. I'm not going to worry about it. And the problem is, when it comes to public safety and people's security, it's all of our problem. And, Speaker, the Premier was not there for the residents of the City of Ottawa. And I, you know, Speaker, you know, the Premier may win in court next week, but he's losing every single day in the court of public opinion. And I can remember three Premiers in this province who, when they were called to testify, Order. who, when they were called to testify before a committee Government or side court, court, were there. Premier McGinty, Premier Harris, Premier Wynne. What makes this Premier any different? They did this because it was the right thing to do. They didn't shirk their responsibility. They knew that that came with the office. So, Speaker, through you, I'll ask again, will the Premier simply drop his court action, Question. apologize to the City of Ottawa, and do the right thing, take his responsibility, and testify before the inquiry in Ottawa? Thank you, Speaker. Premier. Through you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. As the public saw, I was out there non-stop speaking to the people. As the member of Ottawa, as his neighbours, he was hiding in his basement. 
Let me be very clear. This is a federal inquiry, and I love Mr. Speaker. Side, come to order. I, I love that he uses previous premiers had an inquiry. I got to remind him. He was part of the most politically corrupt government this province has up. Will the Premier take his seat? The Premier must withdraw the unparliamentary comment. I withdraw. Start the clock. You may conclude your answer. You have a few seconds left. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, under the previous government, the mining and critical minerals industry were not a priority. And Ontario's economy suffered as a result. That is why our government needs to take urgent action to strengthen Ontario's economy, meet our climate goals, and secure good jobs for the people of Ontario by partnering with this sector. Speaker, people all across Ontario know how crucial investments are to the mining industry and how vital it is to secure them. Speaker, could the Minister of Mines please provide an update on how our government has delivered for the people of Ontario as it relates to mining sector investments? In reply, the Minister of Mines. Mr. Speaker, thank you uh, for the question from the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. I recently attended with the Premier the opening of Valley's Copper Cliff South Mine. It was a tremendous event. The, uh, the uh, Valley was extremely happy to see the Premier go underground uh, to celebrate this reopening of this complex. Valley spent over $900 million to redevelop this mine, and they're going to spend an another $900 million with the Creighton Mine to do the very same thing. Now, they're going to spend $1.8 billion to produce copper and nickel and cobalt, minerals that are essential, essential to produce the batteries that are required to decarbonize our economy. Response? Ontario's Ont 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 economy. And this is totally supported by this government and this premier. We're very supportive of this. We're very ecstatic that this is happening in Ontario under the leadership of this Premier. Thank you. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for his response. Speaker, in the past, projects in the mining industry have taken decades to plan, assess, and put into production. We all know these timelines are simply not good enough, especially if we expect to meet our climate goals. Ontario's mineral exploration and mining industry can be a global leader once again if our government steps up and delivers much-needed support. Speaker, we have, have a significant opportunity to create thousands of jobs by opening new mines and expanding existing ones. Could the Minister of Mines please provide concrete examples on how his ministry is cutting red tape and streamlining processes associated with mining projects, answering the call? for urgent action. Mr. Mines. Once again, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for the question for the member from Renfrew, Nisibing and Pembroke. Mr. Speaker, our message is simple. We cannot go grain without mining, and Ontario is the best place in the world to mine. The time is now to eliminate unnecessary regulatory burden, improve timelines, increase transparency, and improve business creativity. creativity. Mr. Speaker, we built the Crit Creek mine in three years, and perhaps that was a little uh, too fast, but we've got to do better than 15 years to build mines now. Right now, we're developing regulations that will help exploration companies find the critical minerals mines for the future and promote, and promote innovation, new strategies, innovative new strategies to recover critical minerals from old mine tailings. There's much, to more, there's much more to do, Mr. Speaker, but we'll never, we'll never stop driving efficiencies into how the mines are developed Response? because we know how important it is to Ontario and to the globe to mine these critical minerals to support decarbonization of our economy in Ontario and to secure the supply chain. Again, all efforts that are led by the Premier here in Ontario. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. 
Thank you very much, Speaker. And to the Premier, the Public Order Emergency Commission's lawyers have been clear with this government that if the Premier and Minister Jones doesn't testify, there will be important gaps in their record. For instance, last week it seemed that just maybe the government recognized the value of testifying only then declined the Commission's invitation for the moment. According to the Premier, the buck stops with him, but apparently not when he's being forced to answer very difficult questions about the impacts of his decisions. Has the Premier's mind changed? How did the Premier's mind change between last week and this Monday? In fact, uh, in fact Mr. Speaker, uh, Order. Disappointed to see that the opposition is not happy to see me on my feet, <laughs> colleagues. I would have. I don't understand. I certainly value them, I, I guess. But listen, Mr. Speaker, I, I've said on a number of occasions that we actually have been assisting the commission right from the onset. Of course, it's important to assist uh, as the federal government uh, uh, act requires the uh, that uh, the. Uh, that there be a commission of inquiry following the federal government's decision to enact the Federal Emergencies Act, of course we're going to assist. That's why we've provided cabinet-level documents. We're assisting by ensuring that the commissioner of the OPP and other policing officials who were there on the ground helping the Ottawa Police Service and who have important information are testifying in front of the commission because it was, after all, a policing matter. So one would expect Bons? that police officials would be there, colleagues. That is why the Deputy Solicitor General, uh, officials from the Ministry of Transportation are also on the ground. So we have been assisting the Commission, and we will continue to do so, Mr. Speaker, uh, as required. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. To the Premier only, I want to answer from the Premier. He's in the House. On October the 17th, the Premier told the reporters that he had not been asked to appear before Order. the Commission of Ottawa. But lawyers for the Commission revealed that both the Premier and Minister Jones had been asked multiple times to appear voluntarily, with government lawyers being told as early as October the 11th that there was the possibility of a summons. So this government knew that the Premier and the Minister might be compelled to testify before the Premier said he had never been asked by the Commission to appear. Curious, Mr. Speaker, very curious. Can the Premier explain why he said that he was not asked to appear. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I've said on a number of occasions, I'll say it again, and I'll, I'll, uh, order. I'll help the, uh, the members. Uh, Official opposition that, come to order. Uh, the action that took place in the, uh, the Federal Emergencies Act, of course, is, as I've been saying, a Federal Emergencies Act. It was a policing act that took place during the convoy protest, Mr. Speaker. Now, the Commission has asked for our assistance, and that is why we are proactively providing Cabinet documents. That is why the Commissioner of the OPP is, uh, is, is testifying. Member for Davenport, come to order. Member for Ottawa, are on the ground Senator making decisions, are also providing assistance to the Commission as it does its investigation into the Prime Minister's decision to use the Federal Emergencies Act. We will continue to assist the Commission because that is what we should do. Now, at the same time, Member for Ottawa, course, Centre, we come to order. proactive things here in this house with respect to our state of the uh, state of emergency it is too bad that the opposition at the time never thought it was important to participate in those debates in this house in fact when we had Response. discussions and debates over what was happening there they chose to sit down on their hands mr speaker and end debate next question the member for don Valley north thank you speaker in the last few weeks we have seen an increased number of crimes especially ones involving firearms. In some of these incidents, criminals have deliberately attacked police. Just last week, police officers on duty in Scarborough have to escape near death from an active shooter. As well, but all the recent tragedies involving attacks on our police, I know I speak for everyone in this house in conveying our heartfelt sympathy and support to family members of Sran police officers. Speaker, my question is to the Solicitor General, what is our government doing to address the recent threats of violent crimes? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To reply, the Solicitor General. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm grateful to the member from Don Valley North for his important question. And recent attacks against police officers are completely unacceptable. 
And especially at this time, we remember the sacrifice made by Constables Hong and Northrop and Russell. And we can't thank our police officers enough for their heroic work that they do to keep Ontario safe. Monsieur le Président, je suis du, je suis uh, Speaker, uh, I am proud of our police officers who protect uh, Ontario every day. put their lives on the line every day. And we recognize that police officers deserve our support and respect. And we will provide the police with the tools and resources they need to keep us safe. And most importantly, we will have their backs each and every day. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the Minister's response. Speaker, organized crimes is a serious issue, especially in large cities like Toronto. People in my community are concerned about gang activity in their neighborhoods, and the people on my riding of Don Valley North don't deserve to live in the fear because of the actions of criminals. Speaker, the city of Toronto is home to a culturally diverse population, good neighbors, and friendly people. It is not a home for gangs engaging in criminal activities. Speaker, what is the Ministry of Solicitor General's approach to dealing with gang crimes? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, my thanks to the member from Don Valley North for his question. Since our government came into office, we've invested over $300 million in grants for policing in the City of Toronto alone, and more than $28 million of those monies were allocated through our anti-gun and gang strategies. The, we are working to reduce uh, uh, illegal firearms. That's an absolute priority for us. government will continue to invest in Ontario's gun and gangs program and to take action, important action, to stop the illegal firearms that are coming into our province at the international borders. And I urge and I urge our federal counterpart, Ms. Minister Mendicino, to go to the border, make an announcement, and step up the inspections at the border so that Ontario Response. can keep itself safe. Thank you. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontario prides itself on its natural resources, which are protected by conservation officers who are trained and equipped to handle poachers, high-risk arrests, search and seizures, and much more. These officers often find themselves in remote areas alone with little to no backup readily available. For decades, they have been requesting reclassification and higher pay, in line with comparable positions like OPP officers. Why has the government not taken steps to rectify the issue and ensure that Ontario has the resources it needs to protect and grow the province's natural resources? Mr. Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to say that conservation officers in Ontario play uh, such an important role. They have done so for generations. They will continue to do so for generations, and we thank them for that every single day. They have over 200,000 interactions a year with members of the public, making sure that they're educated, making sure that they are following the rules. And it's a big province, Mr. Speaker, and when they needed more, this government provided more. 25 new conservation officers in Ontario, bringing the number to over 200. This government supports our conservation officers. I look forward to meeting with them this afternoon and discussing their concerns. My door is always open to the great conservation officers here in Ontario. Question. Again, to the Premier, this ever-expanding wage gap has led to a shortage in cons conservation officers, leaving an insufficient number of officers to protect Ontario's natural resources. Recruiting 25 is a start. 124 is a barrier. These officers play a vital role in the continued protection of Ontario's natural beauty and ensuring the safety of individuals that are enjoying Ontario's vast resources. Attracting and retaining the best qualified conservation officers is a challenge with the ongoing wage discrepancy. Does the government have a plan to recruit and retain conservation officers? Mr. Natural Resources and Forestry. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I said, my door will be open this afternoon and always open for further discussions. But I'm aware that uh, OPSU and the employer are working on a classification review and understand that uh, members from our enforcement branch are part of the committees to uh, work on the review of this classification. They'll make sure that the work skills and importance of conservation officers are specifically discussed as part of that review. And I'll just remind this house again, 25 new conservation officers doing incredible work throughout Ontario. We thank them every single day. The next question, the member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Every year in October, children's aid societies lead the Dress Purple Day campaign across the province to raise awareness about the role we must all play in supporting vulnerable children, youth and families in our province. Dress Purple Day is an opportunity to raise awareness for all of us, including among children and youth, about their right to safety and well-being in all spaces. My question to the minister is this. How is the government helping to raise awareness for Dress Purple Day? Minister of Children and Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member from Essex uh, for the question. Thank you. And for his good work. Keeping children and youth safe is a responsibility that our government takes very seriously, and it's taken seriously by our partners in children's aid societies across Ontario, and in fact, everyone across Ontario has a role to play in the well-being of children, youth, and families. Today, people across the province will wear purple to show support and remind Ontarians, uh, Ontario's children and youth that the help and support they need is available. There are 50 children's aid societies in Ontario, including 13 Indigenous societies. Help and support is a phone call away, no matter where you live. On Dress Purple Day, we celebrate communities and families and remind ourselves that every child and youth has the right to be safe and supported, and no one is alone. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we can see all members on all sides of the House today are wearing purple, including myself, to show their support for vulnerable children, youth and families. And while dressing in purple demonstrates our support for this important campaign and helps raise awareness of everyone's role in supporting children, there's more that we can do to address some of the challenges vulnerable children and youth are facing. Speaker, my question to the minister is this. What concrete actions is the government taking not only to protect vulnerable children but also to ensure that they feel supported? Sure. Thank you, Speaker. The member of Essex is absolutely right. We want every child and youth to have a safe and loving and stable home and families and communities to be supported and strengthened through preventative measures and services and early intervention. And we want youth in care to feel supported and prepared for the future. And that's why we've embarked on the redesign of child welfare and through which our government is introducing new initiatives to improve the quality of care in licensed residential placements. These include developing a new framework for what residential care looks like, increasing and enhancing oversight and accountability of licensed residential settings, adding 20 new positions across the province to support the management, inspection and oversight of the children's residential services system. Every child and youth deserves a safe, loving and stable home, and our government Response. will continue to work to deliver that. Yes, Next question, the member for Waterloo. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Uh, today, the Financial Accountability Office uh, released a very interesting report, their Fall Economic and Budget Outlook. It, de it details projected funding shortfalls of $40 billion across all sectors over the next six years, $23 billion shortfall in health, 
$6 billion in education, $4 billion in children, community and social services. If you want to keep children safe, I would invest in them. $2.6 billion in post-secondary and a $2.3 billion shortfall in justice. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the government will be sitting on $44 billion in unallocated contingency funds. Will the government be transparent with the people of this province and allocate these contingencies to ensure that there are no painful program funding shortfalls. Answer to the people. Order. Order. Minister of Finance to respond. Well, uh, thank you through you, Mr. Speaker, to the member opposite for, for that question. And uh, I thank her for acknowledging that we have a prudent plan for the people of Ontario. You know, Mr. Speaker, when I, when I listen, I think to myself, you know, did the uh, member opposite and the members opposite across the floor, did they make the historic and unprecedented investments in health care when they had the opportunity? No. Did they make the investments in long-term care and highways Order. and public transit? No. Did they do Order. that, Mr. Speaker? Did they do that? No. Mr. Speaker, did they make the investments to provide housing Order. to the families and to the people that come to this great province that want a home and a roof over their head? Did they do that when they had the opportunity? No, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Order. the answer is very clear. This government has a plan to build Ontario, to make the investments in infrastructure, and support labour to get the job Your done. Response. Speaker, I would never refer to a $23 billion shortfall in health care as historic for the right reason. It's historic for the wrong reason. The FAO report confirmed that Ontario has the funding to invest in this province. Ontario is projected to run a $25.3 billion in surpluses over the next six years. Despite this, the government still thinks it's acceptable to cry poor and hold wage increases for our lowest paid education workers workers at 1.25 per cent or continue to enforce the destructive Bill 124, all while food bank usage hits an all-time high for children and for seniors in Ontario. These policy choices are unconscionable. They are irresponsible. Uh, the, will the government commit today to paying education workers a fair wage? Repeal Bill 124. You can do it. You can pay those people the, what they deserve and, and double the ODSP rates. This is about choices. This government is making the wrong choices for the people of this province. Do your job. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor. Minister of Finance can respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll make my comments through you to the member opposite. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the member opposite took the time to read the 241 pages in the plan to build Ontario that this Premier took to the people of Ontario on June 2nd, and it was roundly endorsed. Take a look at the historic investments in health care, historic, unprecedented investments in health care, in historic and unprecedented investments in education, historic and unprecedented investments in social services, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure she's taken the time to look how we're supporting families and workers and businesses in this province under the leadership of this Premier, rebuilding the economy through the leadership of our Minister of Economic Development, bringing jobs, what a concept, bringing jobs back to Ontario, good-paying jobs, bigger paychecks, take the time to read the budget. Next question, the member for Windsor to come see. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Francophone Affairs. In my writing of Windsor to come see, I'm happy to know that the project was selected under the Francophone Community Grants Program, and that is the a diversity that unites us project at the Appel Moi organization. Can the minister elaborate a bit more on the objectives of the program and how this program supports francophone businesses and stimulates economic recovery? Minister of Francophone Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very happy that the people in Windsor can benefit, benefit from this program to support Frankies. The pro program, which doubled its budget, uh, that is now $2 million, 
helps the dynamism of Francophone communities at the local and regional level. The program to support Ontario Francophone, it's a central uh, initiative of the Francophone Economic Development Strategy. And one of the objectives is to encourage and stimulate the Francophone economic uh, repri reprisal by action. Merci, Monsieur le Président, et merci, Madame la Ministre, pour cette réponse. Uh, C'est formidable d'entendre parler de l'engagement continu de notre gouvernement envers les communautés francophones de l'Ontario, et particulièrement... A, a commitment to uh, the, the program. The Francophone community plays a significant role in our province's cultural and economic success. Speaker, besides the Francophone Community Grants Program, can the Minister of Francophone Affairs tell us a little bit more about the Francophone Economic Development Strategy? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, during my visit to the Toronto Global Forum, I was able to highlight Ontario's Francophonie by addressing all of the participants. We know that the future of the French language is great linked in Ontario to the prosperity of Francophone businesses. And that's why we have established this Francophone Economic Development Strategy, a first in the history of Ontario. The strategy aims to encourage and support Francophone entrepreneurship increase the number of francophone and bilingual workers in Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, we will continue to promote Ontario's francophonie as an economic asset for the first time in the history of the province of Ontario. The next question, the member for Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontario has a child care workforce crisis. In the last month, child care centers in Sault Ste. Marie, Sarnia, and on Manitoulin Island have closed because they couldn't find enough qualified child care staff. Ontario doesn't even have enough workers to operate the spaces we have now, let alone the 71,000 new spaces this government has promised. Speaker, child care workers have been clear that they need higher wages, a salary scale, and decent work standards to stabilize the workforce. Will the government consult with child care workers and do what's needed to solve this crisis? Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the member opposite. We do agree that we need more workers, which is why, under the plan signed with the federal government, a better deal with $3 billion more dollars on the table, because our government had the political wisdom to stand up to the Trudeau government to get the best deal for the students and parents we represent. And if we followed the advice of the New Democrats and Liberals specifically, we would have let a third of operators in the members' riding be precluded from participation, denying moms and dads in this province the right to affordable childcare after it rose by 400 per cent under the former Liberal government. We know, as Conservatives, we can do better. We can make life affordable. We can hire more workers and increase their wages, as we are doing every year over the course of this agreement, a minimum standard, Spons. a dollar increase every year to make it more competitive to retain these workers and finally increase the access and the affordability for the people we represent. That concludes our question period for this morning.